Thank you very much for joining us. I know it's a little odd time to, for you to join and I understand your schedule is pretty hectic. But thank you very much to join us. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thanks for inviting me. Good morning and greetings and I don't know if it's evening time for you, Professor Faith. A uh, uh, lot of greetings from India and Indian Council of Medical Research and Mera India. I personally thank you for agreeing to do this lecture for us. And in fact, uh, the topic is extremely interesting and it is the need of the hour. And today the topic you will be touching upon is immunity in malaria is extremely important. We are talking about vaccines. Despite RTS vaccine being uh, approved by WHO, the quest and search for a better vaccine continues. R21 is also on the horizon. So, and besides that, to understand the mechanisms of immunity are extremely important for this particular disease, since it is not a sterilizing immunity. And uh, so I am really very sure that today's lecture by you will be extremely beneficial to our audience. I, I must tell you, we have ICMR is a large body. We have 26 institutes and within that National Institute of Malaria Research being the only body for malaria research has also field stations across the country. And many of the scientists who are malariologists and are from non ICMR people also are joining this lecture and they will be benefited by your talk. And I'm sure we will keep on engaging with you on email and asking you questions uh, when our audience will have more doubts. So having said that, I thank you once again. And Sachin, I'll leave her in your good hands. So this lecture, uh, I, hopefully this will be recorded and this will be on the Mera India social platform after her consent and approval so that we can have access to this talk even when this is over, right? So yeah. with those very brief words, I thank once again, Professor Faith, and over to you for this talk. Over to you, Sachin. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rahi. So, Professor, just to brief you, Dr. Manju Rahi is a senior scientist at uh, Indian Council of Medical Research Headquarters. Yes. She's, she's currently in, uh, in uh, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. As you know, today is a special day to commemorate, uh, you know, World Malaria Day. And uh, she is pretty busy there, but uh, I, I thank Dr. Rahi also that she she found out some time so uh, this lecture is uh, i uh, warm welcome to all the audience is here and uh, just to brief you we have a very successful lecture series last year we had 12 lectures there and from the very renowned scientists i sent you the brochure also for that and today's lecture is very special to us because of two reasons one is uh, definitely this word malaria day and i am really thankful to professor faith that she agreed on this important day, I know she is very busy and she might have other commitment also on this day. The other reason uh, for this thing, because the uh, Mera India, which is Malaria Elimination Research Alliance, is a special funding program uh, to uh, research in the field of uh, public health implementation and operational research. And uh, it is an inception day of Mera India also. So because of these two things, today's lecture is very special. And uh, I was searching for a, you know, appropriate uh, speaker for that day and my search stopped there when I found uh, Professor Faith and she was kind enough to, you know, agree here. So before, uh, without wasting more time, I know the audience are waiting for this. I, I just uh, brief, uh, I just a few, a few lines about Professor Faith. Professor Faith Osir is a trained pediatrician in Kenya, specialized in immunology in Liverpool and obtained a degree from Open University UK. She is the chair of malaria immunology and vaccinology in faculty of natural science at Imperial College London, where she also served as a co-director of Institute of Infection. She previously led two cross-continental research teams in Kenya and Germany with a vision to make malaria history through vaccination. Her work focuses on vaccine candidate discovery, the identification of correlates of protection and mechanisms, the underpin protective immunity. She also aims to inspire and support the next generation of African scientists to provide solutions that continent gen urgently needs. Her work has led an international honors prize, including Royal Society Pfizer Prize, UK Re African Research Leader Award. She is a TED Fellow. EDCTP Senior Fellow and an official Together Band Ambassador for United Nations Global Goal 3. 
She is the past president of International Union of Immunological Society and was recently awarded with prestigious British Society for Immunology Lifetime Honorary Membership Award. I know this, this, is, uh, this is a very short introduction for you, but in interest of time, I, I invite uh, Professor Faith uh, to start the lecture. Professor Faith, uh, the floor is yours. So, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharma and Dr. Rahi, for your kind words, um, for the kind invitation um, to speak. Today is an important day for all of us who care about malaria. Um, thank you for the work that you're doing and for the programs that you're leading. Um, I think an important message on this World Malaria Day, um, as well as solving malaria, is really that our problems, our challenges in low and middle income countries, we have to bring the leadership um, to solve these challenges. We cannot wait. Um, we cannot wait for others in other places in high income countries um, to help us when crisis hits. Um, and uh, I think it's also a time to reflect on the the incredible response that uh, we saw to COVID, um, but that response, you know, there was just no equity um, in that response. And our diseases, such as malaria, they are killing us um, every day. Um, and so we are in our own emergency, um, but we just don't get that much um, response. And so I'm just uh, grateful to you because you're leading on this work um, for important disease for our people um, and that we must continue to provide this leadership, encourage the next generation. The solutions are going to come from us. Um, I don't think that they will come from anywhere else. And so I just want to encourage all of you to keep doing what you're doing. Um, and it's really important as we as we think about the future. Um, so I'm going to switch into my malaria talk. And OK, so uh, before I go further, I'm first going to just um, encourage you to sign up for this meeting if you've not signed up yet. Um, as uh, Dr. Sharma mentioned, I've been president of the IUIS, which is the International Union of Immunology Societies. And, you know, India, the Indian Society of Immunology is part of us. Um, and for the first time, we're going to have this meeting in Africa. Although this uh, society has been around for almost 50 years, um, we've never had the Congress in Africa. So we're really excited about this meeting. Um, abstracts are open. Um, please um, go to the website, a very exciting website, and, uh, and apply for an abstract. We're raising funding for people for low and middle income countries. So don't be put off if you don't have money. We're gonna we're trying to really raise money to try and get as many people to the conference as possible. Um, so please go to iuis2023.org um, and put in an abstract. And I look forward to seeing you there. Um, okay, on to malaria. So um, uh, what I'm gonna talk to you about today is Plasmodium falciparum. Um, you know that there's at least five species of malaria that are a problem for humans, including Noel's eye, which wasn't there when we were in school, but it's there now. Um, the work I'm going to speak to you is predominantly um, from work we've done in Africa. Um, and, uh, you know, the reason for that is obvious. Um, but I am, of course, aware that the burden of malaria is also very high in India. Um, and so I just present the work from my perspective, but I think that you could take these lessons. Um, it's a similar situation to India. Um, so, yeah, just to just to be clear about that. So the map on the on the left is really showing what our malaria burden looks like in Africa, where there's a lot of malaria, where there's less malaria and where there's no malaria. So the colors. Um, in the North, uh, North Africa and South Africa, there's very, very little malaria. And you can see that there's a lot of malaria in red around the equator, and that's getting less and less in the parts that are there in blue. But in fact, when you go to the World Malaria Report, you find that, you know, 
Africa accounts for over 95% um, of the burden. Um, so over 200 million cases. Um, and you know, when when these when you hear the numbers about these cases, those are actually estimates, and the confidence intervals are in millions. So the the numbers could actually be much higher. Um, the debts are about uh, six over 600,000. Um, for those of you who've experienced malaria, you know that um, when you get your treatment, you could recover completely from malaria. But actually, there are some that despite getting treatment, they end up with lifelong disabilities. Lifelong disabilities are a challenge for us in low and middle income countries because we don't have the infrastructure um, that helps to look after disabled people. Malaria is usually a disease of poverty. Um, it affects people who are poor and adding disability to the difficulties and challenges that these our communities face, um, it's, it's another double blow. Um, and so malaria has a huge economic impact. Um, I always ask people to think about 200 million people um, attending clinics um, all around Africa, all around India, um, spending time in long queues, waiting to get uh, get a ticket, to get seen by a doctor, get seen by a doctor, line up for the lab, then line up to get your result, line up to go back to the doctor. And you spend a lot of time um, in those queues when you go to the rural district um, health facilities. Uh, before you actually get your diagnosis and you get your treatment. Um, and then there are lots of problems. So you, we spend a lot of time trying to access treatment. We spend a lot of time um, ill and away from work because of, um, because of being sick from malaria. Um, children are missing school. It has a knock-on impact on their learning, their long-term ability to earn. And so the economic impact of malaria, you know, we could have a whole lecture about this, um, but it's huge. Uh, and I think that's why it's important for us on World Malaria Day to really think about how we can, pro how we can uh, reduce the burden of malaria. And then when you think about um, malaria control, there are lots of things, um, you know, bed nets and vector control was credited for the um, the success of um, the success of malaria control. I beg your pardon. Um, I've lost my presentation. Yeah, yes, sorry. So bed nets were uh, vector control was really credited for a lot of the reduction that we saw in the malaria burden between two thousand and about two thousand and fifteen along with uh, fast-acting drugs like artemisinins, um, et cetera. Um, but whenever you think about a drug, um, resistance is around the corner. Um, we also have the challenges of fake drugs um, that circulate, unfortunately, in our low- and middle-income uh, uh, economies and markets. Uh, we have uh, fake drugs. Um, but the main thing is really that drug resistance is a problem. And so, um, for an immunologist like me, which is what my lecture will be about, um, it seems that vaccines are a really good um, solution. With vaccines, we've gotten rid of diseases like smallpox. Uh, polio is almost nearly eradicated. I think there's a lot of power in vaccines. And uh, I guess that's my bias um, as an immunologist, but I do believe that they can really work. And so for malaria, as we mentioned, as uh, Dr. Sharma and Dr. Rahi mentioned at the beginning, we do, of course, have the RTSS malaria vaccine. Um, that was October 2001 that that came out. Um, recommendation from the WHO for use in areas with low, with high to moderate to high uh, malaria transmission intensity. And, and that was historic. That was exciting. That was really a step in the right direction. Um, but we had, of course, the challenges that we could do better because, in fact, this vaccine, the efficacy was modest, um, protecting three in 10 severe cases uh, and four in 10 cases of uncomplicated malaria. Um, and the challenges really are that we need to improve the efficacy. With COVID, we were getting vaccines of 80, 90 percent 
over 90% efficacy actually in high income countries and then a little bit less in other parts of the world. Um, can we improve the efficacy of a malaria vaccine to hit that mark? Um, there's the question of the durability of protection. Again, if I could refer to COVID, even with a high efficacy, um, that protection lasted for about six months and people have been getting booster shots approximately every six months um, where the vaccines are available. That's the same situation that we see with, uh, with a RTSS, that the duration waned um, actually within the first year. And again, like COVID, um, I think COVID's made a lot of immunology easy easier to explain. We've had the challenges of strain specificity where the vaccine is more effective against the same strain, um, but less effective against a slightly different strain. And that's what we saw with the alpha variant, the beta variant, eventually Omicron and all the subvariants. And so that's a challenge for vaccinology um, across the board where we have these complicated pathogens. And so R21 again was mentioned and that's close on the heels um, of RTSS um, based on a similar antigen. And I'm not gonna focus much on it, but I'm happy to take questions at the end. And now actually the field is even testing monoclonal antibodies um, that can provide uh, protection for a season, a malaria transmission season. And this seems to be um, working well, especially in areas where the intensity of malaria transmission is short, like three to five months. And so if you could protect people for one season, um, this is actually being tested in the field now. So what Faith works on and what I want to speak about today is naturally acquired immunity. Um, and this is really comes from two observations. One is this old observation that you'll find in papers that were published in the early 1900s, actually, um, and that is that people can become immune to malaria. So when you go to a community, a rural community where there's lots of transmission all year round, intense transmission, you see what I'm showing you on this graph, the distribution of the burden of malaria. So the pink line is asymptomatic infections where you have the infection but you don't even know that you have it. The blue line is mild uncomplicated malaria. So uncomplicated malaria, you know, I'm sure in an Indian audience you've all experienced malaria at some point and it's you know how you feel yeah you feel like you've got covid you're shivering fever you're at home you're unwell you're in bed but you're not necessarily admitted to hospital and you'll likely recover with medication so that's uncomplicated malaria in the blue line and then the green line is severe malaria and what i want you to notice is that the y-axis is the burden, the prevalence, the frequency of severe malaria. It's really high in children. And so when you go to these rural communities, you find that it's the children that are getting frequent episodes of malaria and that they get complicated episodes of malaria that cause them to be admitted to hospital, unfortunately go into intensive care where such facilities are available and, um, and a proportion of them will die. But that seems to be restricted in an area of high transmission to the very young. In that same community, older children will be having uncomplicated episodes of malaria until they are young adults. And by the time they become adults, they're still getting infected. If you do a cross-sectional survey, you find a lot of people have parasites in their blood by PCR, that can now even go to 70, 80 percent and people are just going about their life. Yeah. So they're having the same, same infection that's making their children desperately ill and die. And the adults have the infection and they don't even notice it. And so what we take away from that in a nutshell is that humans can acquire immunity. And I think that's really important because this, for me at least, is a source of inspiration. We're not trying to chase something that's impossible. This is something that we actually observe and it's been reported from multiple um, locations around the world under these um, conditions of transmission. The other pillar of my work is really that you can transfer that immunity. So if you take um, blood 
uh, and purify out IgG immunoglobulin from people um, who have already achieved that state of immunity where they're not getting sick. And you, you, you can use that to actually treat people who come to hospital with malaria. So this experiment was published in 1960 where they did just that. And I always tell people, imagine if you came to hospital to see me with your child that was sick. And I said, look, instead of giving you artemisinin, actually, I'm going to give you this IgG that I have um, obtained from a pool of Africans in Zambia or somewhere. I think most of you would run out of the room and say, I need to find a true doctor. Um, but in fact, this experiment was done. And um, the results are shown in this graph on the right. When given gamma globulin, gamma globulin was given IM to people admitted in hospital already with malaria. And their parasite count, which is what's on the y-axis, came right down. And I don't show it here, but their clinical symptoms also resolved. But you only had that effect with malaria experienced gamma globulin. You didn't have that effect with gamma globulin from the UK, for example. And the difference there is that the people in the UK, they've not experienced malaria. They don't have those antibodies. So this was a malaria specific effect. And so these are two pillars that I'd just like you to hold in your mind. One, that you can acquire immunity and two, you can transfer that immunity from one person to another, and we do that through IgG. That was done through IgG, and that, those paper, that paper is published, and there are a number of papers in that vein that you can look up. And so when you look about, think about IgG, that's an antibody, um, what does it bind to? So here is malaria day, so we can enjoy looking at the complex life cycle of malaria. Actually, I'm not going to go into it in detail, except to say that I my work has focused on the merozoid stage, which is circled here in red um, for several reasons. One, um, this is the stage um, when you get clinical symptoms of malaria. Before this, it's in your skin, it's moving through to the liver, you don't even know you're sick. By the time it gets here, on the second week into your infection, um, that's when you get the clinical symptoms of malaria. The second point is that in the passive transfer experiment I just described, um, IgG was given IM to people who already had clinical symptoms of malaria. So that antibody was binding to something in this stage of the infection that caused the parasite density to come down and the clinical symptoms to resolve. So my work has focused on the merozoid. There are other targets within the, the asexual life cycle, within the gametocyte cycle. Um, the sexual um, stage of the parasite, but actually what I'm going to focus on today is the merozoid. So I like to show this little movie of your circulation, and um, that's the merozoid over there. Um, and what we understand is that it identifies a red cell that it likes, it attaches to the red cell, it reorients, it invades the red cell. Um, and then once it's inside, it multiplies, has lots of daughters and sons, however you like to call them, and these come out and invade new red cells. And this is what has you shivering with malaria. Um, I beg your pardon. And so the questions, I've missed one of my slides, so I'm just going to go back here and say, and so the questions that we've been asking are, what are these antibodies binding? Um, and so we've got a vaccine candidate discovery program that tries to say, well, which antigens on the merozoid are important? And then we have studies designed to look for correlates of protection. How can I know what is which antigens are important? Um, and then lastly, we, which is what we'll focus on today, is the mechanisms. When the antibodies actually bind that merozoid, um, what's the mechanism? How are they actually stopping the parasite from multiplying and reducing that parasite density um, that I showed you in a graph? So what I'm going to describe in the next slide um, is a human challenge, um, uh, a human challenge study. Um, and I'm going to show you what we do in this experiment is we actually infect volunteers 
um, with parasites. Um, the parasites are FDA approved for exactly this purpose. And the reason that we do it is so that we can understand um, the immune response to malaria. And so now the next slides I'm going to show you are actually the results um, of that experiment. Um, and I'm just going to walk you through it. So we actually infected 142 people with um, volunteers with 3,200 sporozoites, a standard dose of sporozoites. So we expect that those sporozoites will go to the liver and then they will emerge um, in the bloodstream. And when they emerge in the bloodstream, we were ready monitoring the rise in parasite density as the days went by and also monitoring whether people developed clinical symptoms. If anybody got sick, the study was stopped, they were treated and they exited. Uh, but here are the rest of the results, which I think you will agree were remarkable. So first, um, we had a series, a set of volunteers in whom following intravenous challenge, the parasites grew as expected. So remember I said we infect on day one, um, we wait for the parasites to go to the liver. They generally show up between day six and day eight um, in our text, in our setting. Um, and then we monitor the blood growth every day. So that's what you see on the x-axis. We're monitoring parasite growth. Um, and we have a predefined threshold that when you hit a certain level of parasitemia, we're going to treat you because we're not waiting for people to get severe malaria. And so in one group of volunteers, we just saw what you'd expect from your textbook, that the parasite is multiplying roughly every 48 hours. Um, and when it hit a certain threshold, the experiment stopped, we treated volunteers and, and they were able to go home. So that was one group of results. In the second group of results, um, immunology's magic began to work. In this group of volunteers in whom we'd given exactly the same dose, treated in exactly the same way, we were not able to detect parasites at all. And we know that it wasn't a failure of the experiment because we were giving a dose that makes everybody who's not immune to malaria come down with malaria. And these guys just chewed up their parasites. We couldn't detect them at all. They stayed with us for 21 days. At the end of the day, 21 days, we treated them just to make sure they don't go home with any parasites. Um, but essentially, they had dealt with that infection the way we described in the in the early PERSIP transfer experiment. There were two more groups of people. One, the parasites appeared and then they self-cleared. So again, no symptoms, no complaining of headache, fever, nothing. We saw that the parasites did appear, but they self-cleared the infection. We treated them at the end just like the others. And then there was a last group in whom the parasites appeared. Um, but they remained at a low density. So they didn't do this 48 hour exponential growth. These volunteers controlled that parasite density at a low level. And so this is published, um, it's almost two years old now. Um, and for me, this was just fantastic because there's something different that happens when you read about something and when you actually do it in your own hands. And we could see that actually there are people that are immune. You can give them an intravenous infection and they control it. And so what we're trying to understand is how do they do that so that it could inform vaccine development. And so we looked up um, these uh, mechanisms of immunity. Um, and so normally, in malaria, we look at growth inhibition. And um, so we had that. Um, and this is really looking at the merozoite and blocking of invasion. So when that merozoite is trying to get into the red cell, um, can you block that interaction with antibody? That's what the growth inhibition assay is asking. And that's our go-to assay for malaria. Whenever you write a grant and you're going to study immunity, you need to say that you're going to look at that because that's what we've looked at for years and years, even though we know that it's not the best correlate of immunity. We also looked at complement activity. Um, we looked at... Um, these remaining mechanisms here are actually FC-dependent mechanisms um, of immunity. 
Um, so there's complement um, activity. And maybe I should just explain that a little bit. When an antibody binds, it's got an FAB part and it's got an FC part. The FAB part is the part that recognizes the antigen. And then the FC part, um, this actually is the business end of the antibody and it recruits other immune cells and other immune factors that can help in the immune response. So one of those soluble factors is complement um, and that's what's shown here. Um, phagocytosis, this is a monocyte. Um, this is a neutrophil, and here we measured reactive oxygen species. Here we measured phagocytosis again, not of the merozoid this time, but of the ring. You know, once the parasite has entered the ring, is that the end of it? Has the parasite escaped or can the immune system still see it? And actually what we saw is that it's not safe. Once it's entered the red cell, the immune system can still see it and rings rings are phagocytosed just as merozoites are phagocytosed and then we looked at antibody dependent um, cellular cytotoxicity and that's adcc this is a natural killer cell and there we measured degranulation and interferon gamma secretion so for the immunologists, for all these assays, what we're doing is looking at our target, which is the merozoite. We're incubating that with antibodies from the people in the study that I showed you who controlled malaria or who did not control malaria. And then we are co-incubating that with immune effectors um, such as complement or phagocytosis and then we have an immunological readout so we looked at those fc mechanisms in addition to the growth inhibition and uh, what we found was um, really surprising that in fact the fc mechanisms were much better correlates of protection um, than the um, than, than, the, than the growth inhibition. Um, so I first just explained this is a forest plot. Um, these are a range of things that we measured. Some of them are function, some of them are just binding. Um, and how to interpret this is one here means um, there's no difference between people who are protected and people who are susceptible. Um, so all my life, really, all my career, I've been measuring things and my estimate, um, my estimate of how well is your measure predicting protection was usually pretty close to one. And you're just struggling to get a significant value so that you can write it in your paper. Um, but now you will see that with these measures, actually, we've got a lot of measures close to zero here. Um, and you have complement over there. You have a neutrophil burst here. Um, you have um, ADCC here. So we're getting much better um, correlates of protection. And what was interesting was that our usual assay, what was the standard, um, this was actually not significantly um, correlated with protection. And so what we found, and the take home from that, is the FC mechanisms were much better correlates of protection than what we had been measuring before simply um, with the GIA. And so because we had measured quite a number of different FC mechanisms, we asked the question, you know, Given that you have all these immune cells in your body at the same time, you've got neutrophils, natural killer cells, eosinophils, you know, monocytes, phagocytes, you've got all of them at the same time. What we in the lab do is we measure one thing at a time. So if we looked at the combination of all those things, would we find that it was a better correlate of protection? And is it actually a more realistic way uh, or holistic way of doing it? Um, and so we looked at the breadth of function and we haven't measured everything under the sun, but out of the ones that we measured, um, we asked if you can do more of that activity, um, was that a better marker of predict protection? And the answer was yes, and that's what we're showing here um, in this survival analysis, that people who had a lot of function, the breadth of function, um, that these accounted for the most protection than people who just had one 
who had, excuse me, none, one, two, etc. that as the number went up, you could account for greater protection the more people had a breadth of FC function. Um, and some of those papers are published, uh, some are still being written up or revised. Um, and so we looked at how this breadth of FC function correlated with the binding to the IgG, because remember I, I told you that our assays were involving merozoites, um, and what I show is what we've shown is really that it correlates very well. People who have high binding to the merozoite, which is what you see on the axis, it turns out that they also have high breadth of uh, function, and so that says that the better you can bind your merozoite, so your FAB is important, you need to see antigens on your merozoite, um, that correlates well with how much effect a function um, that you can recruit um, that, um, yeah, that helps to clear your parasites. Um, and so in summary, I just wanna say that um, in fact, our malaria situation globally is, is serious um, and the numbers got worse during the pandemic and that's why it's really important for us today to reflect on World Malaria Day and to look at how, how, we, how can we go forward. Um, we actually need new tools. Um, I've spoken to you about vaccines, um, but we're likely to need a combination of tools um, to actually try and tackle this problem. Um, um, we have our historic vaccine, um, but even within that, we still have challenges. And I've mentioned some of them. Um, some of them are immunology. We're still learning about what the correlates of protection are and understanding how people respond to the infection. Um, there are challenges with implementation that you mentioned at the beginning. There are also challenges with manufacturing and supply, um, and we can discuss those at the end. Um, there's still a need for a lot of fundamental immunology, um, cell biology research um, for vaccines. There are new technologies that are coming along. Um, mRNA is important. Um, uh, we can discuss that. Uh, monoclonals I mentioned, and I've shown you that we are using human challenge studies as a tool to try and address um, some of these questions that we we are yeah, that, 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 that still need to be solved. Um, I think that we need massive investment um, in R&D. Um, and on this slide, I had African leadership, and I would like to say Indian leadership, because um, again, in India, the challenges are, are Indian. And I think we just need to really begin to think about homegrown leadership um, alongside massive investment. Um, and if you think about how much money we put into COVID um, for the vaccines, we put $52 billion over two years, whereas in malaria in almost 10 years, we had only put $6.3 billion. So you can see that actually there's a massive, massive gap um, in the amount of funding that we have for um, research um, in malaria. And I think that's a big deal and that's really needed. And so I just want to close by thanking my colleagues um, to do a human challenge study. It's actually a massive, massive undertaking and not everybody's on these slides, but just to give you a flavor of, of the participants, um, our challenge agent we got from Scenaria, um, a company in the US. Um, we thank our participants because the study has been really informative and we're building new studies on that. We were funded by Welcome. Um, and the sponsor for the study was um, the University of Oxford. Our participants were hosted in our local university, Pwani University, that's um, in the coast of Kenya. Just want to thank everybody. And then for the data that I've just shown you a snippet of, um, I want to thank the members of my team. Um, these people have all moved on. They're doing postdocs, fellowships, uh, masters, etc., cetera, um, all around the world. And I'm really proud of them. And I just want to thank all the people that have funded me and supported me over the years. And uh, yeah, thanks very much for your attention. And I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Faith, for taking us, uh, you know, from the uh, life cycle of uh, plasmonium to 
the controlled human malaria infection mechanism of immunity and FC mechanism that were wonderfully covered by you and uh, I appreciate that uh, you know you included some of the you know key points for early career researchers what to include what not to include in their you know future grants and publications so if you permit we have a few questions if you permit uh, may I ask on the behalf of the audience I see lots of questions in the chat. I don't know if people will read them out. Yes. So if you if you allow, we can we can take a few from these. Okay. So the first question is: uh, What is your point on passive immunization in terms of economic feasibility as a mass mass drug or prophylactic? Yeah. So that's a that's a great question, and that's what a lot of people are asking. Um, they're not, I, I think I would relate that question really to the question of monoclonal antibodies. And people are asking in the field, as a field, we're asking, one, is this really going to be feasible? Um, monoclonal, the cost of production of monoclonal antibodies is still high. Um, and the counter argument against that is that costs are coming down. As technology improves, costs come down. Um, and so it's possible that the costs might come down until it's actually possible to do. The second question that's commonly asked is, um, can you get a formulation that you can give to children um, in an easy way? Um, you know, the initial studies were giving it as an IV infusion. Um, and you can imagine sitting your three-year-old or your five-year-old um, down when they're ill um, to get an infusion of a monoclonal, or if they're being given as a preventative measure, you know, it's very hard to keep a five-year-old still um, while you give them a monoclonal antibody. So that's also got to come down to, will we be able to give this in a formulation and a format that we can easily administer to children? Um, and then there's still the challenges of will people develop resistance if it's targeting a particular um, antigen within the parasite, you know, are they going to, is the parasite going to evolve away? And so are we going to continue to keep on chasing just as we're chasing with, uh, with COVID vaccines? Um, so I think that there's still many questions on passive um, administration of uh, antibody uh, and, um, and, and, you know, I've mentioned some of them. And I think that the important thing is really that um, two things. One, when you come up with an intervention, you've also got to think through about the feasibility of that intervention for sure. Uh, but two, I think it's important for us to explore all avenues. When you've got a uh, malaria burden, the curve is just sitting flat and just going up, um, then you've got to put all options on the table. And I think that as we continue to innovate while you're working, that's when the solutions will come. So let's not be scared. Let's take the steps and, and see where those steps lead us. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. So next is what? What is your take on uh, trap-based vaccines that targets haplocytes? <laughs> so uh, I think my take is what's the result of the clinical trial? Yeah, um, that's 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 really what I would say. Um, I think that um, you know I've talked to you about the merozoid stage but there's actually work going on on every step of the cycle there are people targeting sporozoids people targeting liver stages people targeting gametocytes people targeting placental malaria we didn't talk about malaria in pregnancy at all um, and so there's just a lot of activity so I wouldn't single out trap um, I just have to say that wherever you feel you've got wherever whatever stage you're working on um the important thing is we're all trying to eradicate malaria um and the success is the readout you know in the end do your clinical study and show us the data and so i think that with um with trap you know the reason it didn't go ahead uh was because the data did not support it and and that's part of our trial and error as we try and figure out um, how to how to get overcome malaria. So I think so I don't want you to take the message away that it's hopeless. You know, I think every stage is important and every investigator who's trying um, has a good mission 
yeah and uh, the question is does it work and you can't know until you try it out so so that's that's where we're all at yeah 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 okay another is uh, what do you think why symptomatic patients has less antibody response than anti asymptomatic one uh, because we think that the antibodies are protective yeah so remember i showed you the passive transfer graph and I showed you that if we take antibodies from people who've already become immune and we give them to sick people, actually the sick people recover. And so we think the symptomatic patients are symptomatic because they don't have antibody. And that's also what we saw in our challenge study that um, although we had all adults, what I didn't tell you is that we recruited them from different parts of Kenya so we went to the part of Kenya where we know there's a lot of malaria all year round. Those guys are full of antibodies. We recruited some volunteers from there. And then we went to other parts of Kenya where there's no malaria. Yeah. So when we recruited those people, we knew and we tested and showed that they didn't have antibodies. Yeah. They were like people in UK because there's not much malaria there. And then we challenged these groups. And that's what we saw. Those with antibody, they just didn't come down with illness at all. Those without antibody, they became symptomatic within a few days. Actually, I didn't show you. If you look in the publication, you'll see that people started getting sick day seven, day eight, day nine, quite soon after the parasites started appearing. And these tended to be the people without antibody. So we think that really... You know, that's our own way of showing that the antibodies are protective. And that's what we're trying to understand, which antibody exactly, because your body's got millions of them. So we're trying to really narrow down. But which one is it? Um, because that's what we could then use to, to, to make good vaccines. So we really think that the antibodies are protective. Okay, I'll take uh, two more. So one is, uh, do all the controlled human malaria infection groups share the same ethnicity? Um, no, um, and that's a good point because I told you that we recruited them from different parts of the country, so they had different tribes, yeah? They had, uh, you know, in Kenya, actually, we have 47 tribes for such a small country, um, so they were different tribes. And so I think your question you're asking, could there be genetic determinants Um of protection and i think the answer is yes there's there's literature about that what we did um there's varied levels of literature about that the strongest evidence is that people who carry sickle cell trait these ones are protected from malaria and so we excluded those um, from the study right at the beginning um, so that we could really try and concentrate on antibody effects but yes is there a possibility that there's some other genetic factor that we haven't measured yes and i think that there are different Different groups that are looking at into that yeah okay so i'll take the last one on 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 rts so one is rts s is a largely anti-sporozoic vaccine which mechanism will be most likely one is this. <laughs> i know so, this is uh, this is from a very senior uh, colleague from dr pavan sharma is a senior immunologist from icgb so this yeah is Yes, I smile. I smile because I think that even the developers cannot tell you exactly what the mechanism is. Um, and this is a question that people have looked at. Is it antibodies? Is it T cells? And I don't think that it's uh, it's black and white. Um, I really don't think so for all the all the different papers I've read. Um, there's conflicting results. And so it's, um, you know, uh, people have tried to look at um, a range, a range of assays, to be honest, and I don't think that there is a clear correlate. Um, and for the field in general, there's no universally accepted um, correlate um, of protection. So I'm not actually trying to evade the question. I think even if you ask the developers, you can't really get a straight answer there. There's suggestions. It might be, it might be antibody, and you know, antibody is the easiest thing that we can measure. We can always look at an antibody response, but it might be CD8 T cells. It might be T follicular helper cells. Um, everybody shows a little bit of data that suggests this is the correlate. The biggest problem is that it's not consistent. Um, between the studies, and that's why we don't really have a we don't really have a universal correlate. So, yeah. Okay, so I'll take the last one. What is the future of modified version of RTS? 
of R21, <laughs> if the question is about R21, then I think everyone's got to keep their eyes and ears open. Um, uh, the status of things is that uh, from the WHO, there's still a review process going on on the RTSS phase, RT, R21 phase three data. On the ground, some African countries, Ghana, Nigeria, advertised, announced last week that they've approved it for use in their countries. So um, the situation is actually changing almost, you know, on a day to day and week by week um, status. And so um, I think, um, as I understand it, um, Serum Institute are going to manufacture and uh, distribute the vaccine. And I think from what we're hearing, it looks like that may already be starting. So I think that's uh, my expectation is that it will be taken up. Yeah. So with this, I know this is pretty, you know, early uh, in morning for you. So with this, I would like to conclude this wonderful session. I have, uh, you know, you can see also we have other questions also. And yeah. I request and I'll send you these questions through an email and uh, I would really yes. appreciate if you can get a response through an email. So thank you very much, Professor Faith, for uh, giving us your valuable time today. And we are very much delighted to have you here. And uh, I request you personally, whenever, because situation is better now, whenever you are in India, please visit us. We are, are at uh, National Institute of Malaria Research at ICMR. So please yeah. visit us. So with this, I thank all the audience. And before we close the session, I have an announcement, important announcement to uh, announce here that uh, we will uh, have a... Uh, Dr. Abhay Bang, who is a very well-known, you know, public health researcher, is a Padamshri uh, awardee from Government of India. We will have his uh, talk on 28th uh, of uh, this month, followed by a panel discussion. And the theme of the panel discussion would be, uh, or, uh, like, uh, which has given by uh, WHO, time to deliver zero malaria, invest, innovate, and implement but in Indian context. So I request all the audience, all the researchers who have joined us, they can join us in person at ICMR headquarters. We will begin at uh, 2 in the afternoon and this would be a 2-3 hour session. So I request you all please join us there. Thank you very much, Professor Faith and the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.